Amen. Brother James attends my home group. Doesn't it look like a hitman from the mafia? You need to attend this home group. Or... Let's stand to our feet. Amen. I tell you, I am so excited this morning. Uh, and if last night and this morning is any indication of what is to come, I tell you what, get ready because God is going to really do an amazing thing here at Faith Church. Um, this weekend, and I don't think it's really any coincidence. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, it, was a, it was a different sermon that I was going to preach this weekend just to cover Pastor Santora for the last weekend. He'll, he'll return next weekend. And about a week or so ago, the Holy Spirit just uh, led me to change this thing. And I can definitely, definitely see why. Uh, if you're wondering why we have the banners here, you probably saw it coming in. You know, each one of you that are here this morning, like last night and this morning, are about to embark in what will definitely be a historical change here at Faith Church. Because one of the things that has been heavy on our senior pastor's heart, Santora, is he really wants to change the culture of this church. And the way that we're going to change the culture of this church, because some of you probably heard, you know, well, we've done small groups before. Not the way we're launching it this particular weekend, okay? The idea of changing the culture of this church is to change the disconnect that seems to sometimes take place with people that attend church and not really feel connected to this body. And we're going to change all of that. So my job today is to deliver to you guys the vision of Connection Group as God has laid it out in our pastor's heart. I really believe this word is going to not just encourage you, but it will challenge you. It will challenge you like never before. And one of the things that it will reveal, if anything, is the important role that you have here at Faith Church. Because I want to tell you something. Nobody here is here by coincidence. Can I hear an amen out there? You are not here by coincidence. You don't attend Faith Church by coincidence because remember, in the end, you have made yourself a part of this body of Christ. And today, we're going to really bring clarity to what that means. So how many are ready to hear God's word this morning? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I give you praise and honor. I'm so humbled, privileged, and honored to deliver this word. I pray, Father God, that right now our minds are so attentive that your Holy Spirit is running throughout this room, Father God, like an electrical current, just keeping us alert, awake, and charged to receive, Father God, this word that's going to empower us to do great things. We believe that, and we have no doubt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now turn to your neighbor and say, now don't bother me because God's about to talk to me right now. Go ahead. He doesn't mind. You can tell him that. Amen. Amen. If you need a Bible, just hold up your hand and an usher will bring one to you. I'm going to be sharing even some testimonies that have been taking place even as soon as this weekend as a result of this word going out. But here's the thing. I said, I mentioned cultural change. I mean, why are connection groups so important to the life of the church? Because in order to answer this question, we have to clearly understand what are God's expectations from us as a church? And when I say church, I am not referring to the 80,000 square foot facility. I am referring to you. So turn to your neighbor and say, you are the church. Go ahead. Okay. Because here's the thing. Besides the mandate to proclaim the gospel to the entire world, it is just the initiation. Because from there, we need to get to what it says to Psalm 133 verse 1. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Everybody say dwell together. And notice the word unity. Everybody say unity. Now, I got to tell you something. This is not one of those pleasant verses that we just quote because it sounds good. This is a real challenge for the church because what this tells us is that we have to strategically remove the disconnect factor. We have to strategically remove the disconnect factor. If we're going to come together in unity, then it is important to know that there must be some uh, some things that we must have in common in order for us to fulfill this mandate or in order for us to be unified. We have to have certain things in common. It could be a goal. It could be a cause. It could be a club, a fan base. But here's the thing. Groups form because they have some commonality. Everybody say commonality. 
You're going to hear me say you, that word a lot this morning. I mean, I find it interesting, if I can be very bold and honest with you this morning, I find it interesting that even Christians will take more interest in secular commonality than that of spiritual commonality. For example, you know, as you guys know, we're all happy about football season. Can I hear any men out there? Yeah, we're excited about that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I find it interesting, uh, you know, especially let's say I'm on Facebook, I'm watching the Oscars. How many Christians comment on the Oscars? How many Christians take part of the ALS Bucket Challenge? I mean, if you haven't done that or heard about that, where have you been in this planet lately, okay? But here's the point. It's funny how we have commonality with a lot of other things, but then when we talk about commonality in the church, we tend to hesitate. And I often ask the question, why? That's why we need to deal with this issue. Look at your notes. Point number one, commonality is something that is discovered by relationships and not in passing. Something that is discovered by relationships. Everybody say relationships. Okay, this is important because Acts chapter 2, verse 44, and I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version, says, And all who believed, who adhered to and trusted in and relied on Jesus Christ were united and together they had everything in common. Everybody say common. Now, by definition, the word common simply means community. We have to be a community. But watch this. The only way... We are defined by community is when we act like a community. A community is not just a group of people that call themselves churchgoers. No. If we are going to be a community, then we have to act like a community. In other words, the only way community is defined is by our actions. Webster's, for example, defines it this way, okay? A community is relating to a community at large, belonging to or shared by two or more individuals or things or by all members of a group. There's something that we have in common. There's something that we practice that's in common, okay? So community, okay, is a unified body of individuals that have things in common. Now watch this. If I were to take the Webster's Dictionary, take Acts 2.44, and rewrite it in what I call the FVT version, which simply stands for Frank Vega version, okay? It would read this way, okay? Here's how I would rewrite this, okay? Acts 2.44 and the FTV sh- uh, version says, and all who believed were united because they were a community that shared things and cared for one another because they were a unified body of individuals that had common interests within a larger society. This is the message of Acts chapter 2, verse 44. Now, Here's the thing. Now, I'm going to say some strong thing this morning, but don't hate me until the end of the sermon, okay? Or don't throw your chairs at me, because I need to share some real definitive truth, okay? What this is saying is that we can never isolate ourselves as individuals or as a body. We can never isolate ourselves as individuals or as a body. And I'm going to take this a whole other level. Are you ready? To intentionally isolate yourself from the body is sin because Christ expects the opposite from each and every one of you. If you claim to be a Bible believer, a Christ follower, then you must understand and receive the revelation of what it means to connect. It is something that each of us must take ownership. It is something that each of us must initiate. We can't ignore this thing. Now, I know some of us like to come to faith church unnoticed. You know, we kind of come in like a stealth and we leave like a stealth. I mean, you know, you you like when the lights are dark, right? Matter of fact, some of you would like the lights even darker. You know what I'm saying? Nobody knows that you're coming, okay? But here's what you have to understand. That is not Christ's intention for you to attend faith church. The whole intention for you to, to attend faith church is, I mean, if you're born again, then obviously it goes way beyond that, okay? Christ wants you to be a true Christ followers. So what does this mean? Okay. James 4, 17 says the following. Remember, because I know what we try to do. Now, when I said that isolation or intentional isolation is sin, some of you say, well, Pastor Vega, I think you're exaggerating a little bit. Here's the thing. It's funny how we like to justify ourselves by simply thinking that we are okay because we don't cheat, we don't steal, we don't fornicate, we don't commit adultery, okay? But here's what the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 17. It says, remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then what? And then not do it. 
It is a sin, okay, to know what you ought to do and then simply not do it. How many of you know that any time Christ gives us a mandate, of a command, and we choose not to obey, it's called disobedience. Can I hear an amen even if it hurts? That's just flat out disobedience. And we need to finally come to terms with that. I mean, ask yourself how many times you've heard believe, grow, and serve, but all you seem to want to do is hear, heard, and ignore. Okay? And that's not what this is all about. There's a meaning behind that vision, believe, grow, and serve. There's substance behind that. And here's the thing. When you capture it, absorb it, take ownership of it, then you will see your life transform. But while you're just hearing it and necessarily ignoring it, you're missing out on the most important thing. Because here's the thing. God is calling us to be burden carriers. Point number two, okay. If we're going to fulfill the biblical mandate of community, then we have to commit to being a burden carrier. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Let me expand that a little bit, because when we talk about burden carrying, uh, you know, there's a number of areas that we need to go with this. I mean, you probably heard one of them. Uh, Brother James talked about how we, uh, you know, we minister one to another, not just spiritually, but even needs, whether it's clothes, whether it's finances, whatever the case may be. We, we support each other. We show love for each other. But I want to share with you that one of the greatest burdens that God has is to see the world lost. It's a tremendous burden for him. And we must share that burden. We must create environments where we're interacting with people, okay, where we can share the gospel and not fear it or worry about what the reaction or what the response is. So think about right now, ask yourself this question and be honest with yourself. Are you carrying anybody else's burden? See We're called and mandated to be burden carriers. You heard the song that uh, Brother Ryan just led just now. I purposely picked out that song because it is so ripe for this particular sermon. Are you a burden carrier? Going back to what I was trying to say before, okay, if we simply ignore the word of God, guess what? It's disobedience. It's sin. And we have to come to terms with that. Now, the good news is God will participate with us when we become burden carriers. Psalm 68, 19 says, please... Praise be the Lord to God our Savior who daily bears our burdens. So we have an awesome and ultimate partner. If this is going to happen, then we have to do more than just come to church once a week. We must come a community by building relationships. Everybody say relationships. If you read the New Testament, the whole New Testament is about building relationships. It's all about building relationships. So we can't ignore that. We can't disconnect from that. My goodness. And, and, and forget this thing about, well, Pastor Vega, you know, I'm just so shy. Let me, let me ask you something. If you are shy, how in the world do you get married? I'll let that one float out there for a little while. How in the world? It wasn't like your wife married a mummy, okay, or vice versa for that matter. You had to have conversation, and you had to initiate it. Uh, you ain't that good looking. Hello, Okay. It's not like, oh, wow, you know, love at first sight. Oh, love, love is at first sight until you get to know the person. <laughs> okay. When, you, when, when they start talking, get to know them. My point is that something was initiated, and all of a sudden you guys became a married couple. See? We all have the power to initiate, especially if we are all walking temples of the Holy Ghost. Do you believe that this morning? Okay. So we have to take ownership of relationship, okay? This is where connection comes in. Our hope and desire is that each of you will see that being a part of a connection group is not an option, but something that we must make time for. The Bible talks a lot more about relationships than it does works and serving. And maybe that's an area that we have to correct. I know you hear a lot about serving, serving, serving. And don't get me wrong, that's important. But we realize now that Far more important is up is us developing relationships. We need to develop relationships. And here's the thing. All of us probably are influenced by different relationships. Take an inventory, for example, of all the relationships you have and also think about how those relationships influence you. For example, I have to believe that we have work relationships, we have bowling relationships, we have shopping relationships, we have t-ball parent relationships. But my question to you this morning is, how many godly relationships you have, okay? 
Because here's the thing. We need godly relationships in order for us to be inspired and encouraged. I mean, here's the thing, okay? I want to read a scripture to you to remind you of something. Now, this scripture that I'm about to read, it's a little harsh. It's heavy. It's hard. But how many of you know that just because a scripture is in the Bible that's harsh and heavy, we're not to ignore it either. Can I hear an amen out there? Okay? It's important that we, I, I, I define for you the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous and what our role is when it comes to the unrighteous. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, okay, let's go there, okay, verse 9 through 11 are some very strong statements from the Apostle Paul. And here's what it says. It says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, no swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Such were. Say were. Okay? Such were some of you. That means that when you look at all these definitions of people that are considered unrighteous, okay, which basically is just talking about unbelievers or those that have not received Christ as their only Savior, regardless of what they're struggling with, guess what? What this tells me is that there's hope for everybody. There is hope for everybody. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Are you ready? It says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Look closely at that last statement. You were justified in the name of the Lord by Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. This, folks, is our commonality right there. You went from this particular uh, community to that community. You, came, you, you, you went from the unrighteous community to the righteous community. Is everybody following me? That's our commonality. But guess what? We just can't leave it at that. We have to explore. We have to dig into this thing because the point is, do you enjoy socializing more with unbelievers than you do with the saints? I find it interesting that sometimes you hear a lot about, you know, get invited to go to this, get invited to go to that, okay? Not that anything that you get invited to are wrong or, 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 or you know, even if, if they're secular in nature, but why is it that when we talk about, let's say, connection groups or getting involved with the ministry of the church, which you are called to do, there's resistance, there's hesitation. You know what that proves to me? What that simply proves to me is that we have an enemy. Can I hear an amen out there? That, that, that should give you the reassurance, man, this must really have real purpose, you know, to see this resistance. And that has to change, okay? You know, I want to remind some folks in the ministry even world that seem to want to justify their soft message on sin, okay? And we're seeing that a lot lately. It's like we're afraid to offend the world. So let me bring clarity to this because here's the thing, okay? Yes, Jesus was a friend of sinners, okay? I mean, Casting Crown wrote a wonderful song on the subject. Jesus, friends of sinners. And a lot of times, we want to be soft, let's say, on talking about sin because it's like, well, let's, let's remember Jesus was a friend of sinners. But let me explain something. To, to us all this morning, okay? The purpose of the friendship was not to be their savior. Okay, I'm sorry. The purpose of the friendship was to be their savior and not just their friend, okay? That's why Jesus says in John 3, 36, okay? He said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. I'd say that's pretty heavy. Can I hear any men out there? Now, Jesus is clearly defining for us the standard. He is clearly defining for us the community, the unrighteous community and the righteous community. Yes, he was a friend of sinners. But you know what? You ever notice that every time Jesus interacts with somebody, I mean, yeah, they were drawn to him by his love. They were drawn to him by his compassion. They were drawn to him by his mercy. But in the end, they finished repenting. They finished changing. Okay? And this is what I'm saying. Yes, we have a very powerful, loving message, okay? But the purpose of that message is not to leave somebody feeling good about themselves. The purpose is the message is to deliver how Christ mandates us to deliver it so that there's conviction. And the person needs to decide, is he going to be a Christ follower or simply an attender? Are we learning something this morning? Okay? So don't think that, you know, just because he says he's a friend of sinners, that all of a sudden we're going to back out. And, well, you know, he was a friend of sinners. Here's the thing. I, 
you know, if somebody asks me a straight question. Now, here's the thing. I, I, I'm not that smart, okay? I, I, I'm not smart. I just quote the Bible. Are you hearing me this morning? So if you ask me if this is a sin, I'm, I'm simply going to say, well, here's what the Bible says. I'm not going to hesitate, okay? I don't, and I don't know why we need to hesitate. Why do we need to hesitate communicating truth? If the person is asking, it's because they need to change. They need to change. They need a challenge. They need something that can be, can be deposited in their life that can stir a need to change. And here's where relationships are important because we don't have to hit it hard. And let me give you a great testimony and an example. There was an individual, okay, well, there was a, there was a, um, a lady that was attending our home group, okay, for a while. And um, her, her husband wasn't, wasn't attending, okay, uh, because he was kind of pessimistic about, uh, for lack of a better word of saying it, Pentecostals, okay. Thought that all we did was eat, drink, and sleep Bible, and we had nothing else better to talk about, nothing else better to really relate to, okay? So he was very hesitant about associating himself uh, with the, let's say, charismatic or Pentecostal community. So what happened was, uh, last year, yeah, it was last year, <laughs> you know, we invited him to my son's birthday party as part of, uh, of, of just being a part of the, connected to our home group through his wife, okay? And here's the thing. Um, this, part, this particular birthday party had a lot of purpose because most of you or some of you probably know my son Wesley, right? Wesley does everything with a purpose. So Wesley was pretty upset that in the United States of America, we celebrate Sweet Sixteens and we do nothing for the guys. <laughs> so he's like, this has to change. So dad, I want you to celebrate for me a manhood Sweet Sixteen. And that's what we did. So we called it a coming out of teenage to maturity party, Okay. It was great, you know, but here's the thing, okay, so we invited him, uh, you know, his wife, the, the wife and, and him, and he came, and, um, you know, we engaged him. Now, throughout that whole event, okay, not once did we preach to him. All the conversation was surrounded around trying to get to know who he was and very pleasant guy, and, and, and that was pretty, and the only thing that we did is at the end, yeah, we had a little spiritual ceremony for Wesley, okay, but here's the thing, are you ready? I come to find out during the week that uh, she contacts us to tell us, you know, my husband was so impressed by the group because basically he realized that we are normal people. (laughs) We are normal people, okay? So didn't touch Jesus. And so he shows up in church that Sunday, okay? Now turn the clock a year later. He's been coming ever since, okay? And even throughout this whole time, still a little pessimistic, still a little skeptical, you know. And so we took a break from the home group for about six weeks during the summer. And all of a sudden, you know, I decided, hey, guys, let's have a a barbecue picnic kind of to relaunch, you know, our home group gathering. Everybody was really excited because we were kind of missing it. So so we got together uh, a week and a half ago at my house for a barbecue. And we're all there. And he's there. And we had a a couple of new guys that joined our group. um, And these guys were engineers. You know, and they started talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, solar energy and, you know, how to create. Because one of the guys works for a company that creates energy, uh, greenhouse energy. And they're going into this real elaborate thing. And this guy that I'm talking about in particular is, is very intelligent that way, you know. So they're, they're struck. I'm in there. They're struck at a company. These guys are talking way over my head. I just said, you know, you guys keep talking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the ladies. You, 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 I, I just join the ladies. I, you know, I, I, they're, they're talking about shopping. I can, I can relate to that, actually. Okay. So the, so the thing is, that, that conversation carried on all, almost the whole afternoon, this whole evening. Okay. That was two, two weeks ago. A week later, when he came to church that Sunday, he raised his arm up to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. <laughs> now, here's the point. Notice. Throughout the whole time during our developed relationships, we didn't necessarily mention Jesus. We tried to define community to him. He saw it, okay? And without us pushing the envelope, he received Christ as the Lord and Savior. Folks, you see the power of relationships. We didn't even preach the gospel to the guy, okay? It was all about commonality. It was all about community. And this is something that God is mandating from each and every one of us. Our primary goal for socializing uh, with unbelievers is to get them to know Jesus. And by getting back, and let me just get back to the lesson here, because I was just a, a testimony I want to throw at you guys, to say that you are too busy to get together with a common group of believers is to say that you can go about your Christian life alone. And let me tell you something, that is impossible. And here's why. Okay, here's why that's impossible. 
First of all, how many of you know that we are the body of Christ? Do you believe that this morning? Okay. And as a body, okay, we all have different functions. Every single one of us has a different function. We all have a part to fill. Now, I'm very impressed with folks that can maybe, you know, whether they're born without it or they have an accident, you know, the veterans that come back from the war, all of a sudden they don't have arms, legs, missing an eye, nose, ear, whatever, and they carry on with their lives. But they do it with a lot of help, with a lot of assistance. I want you to imagine yourself for a moment without some key parts of your body or key senses. You know, think about what life must be without arms. Think about what my life must be without legs. Think about the fact that when, the, when one of these key elements is missing, how many of you know that no matter how strong you overcome it, you're going to notice it's missing? Can I hear an amen out there? Well, I got news for you. This is how the body of Christ is when you're not involved. Why? That's how important you are. You are a part of the body of Christ. You are a part of this body. When you're not involved, when you're not developing relationships, when you're not reaching out, I got news for you. The body of Christ is being handicapped. And I'm not putting guilt on you. I'm just trying to make you realize how important you are. Turn your neighbor. Give him a big smile and say, you are important. Go ahead, tell him. Because some of you are getting all frowny out there on me right now. You're getting all ugly out there. Okay? But it's true. Think about it. If we are a body, like the song says, we're the hands, we're the feet. We're the ears. We're the eyes. Amen? That's who we are. You have a function, and it's an important one. Why? Because it's about fulfilling eternal purposes, not temporary purposes. Think about the impact you can have if you begin to exercise your gift, if you begin to just influence other people, inviting them over your house for some coffee and some Bible discussion, finding out what the needs are, developing relationships. Because every time you lead somebody to Christ, I got news for you, you have changed their eternal destiny forever. Folks, that's powerful. Can I hear an amen out there? I mean, think about it. You, God used you to rescue these folks from going to hell. Now they're going to heaven simply because, you know what, I'm going to connect. I'm going to be a part of the body. Okay? Okay? If we are a body, as the Bible says, then we need to act like a body. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5 says, Just as our bodies have many parts, say many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with the body, with Christ's body. We are many parts. We are. Say we are. We are, we are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Disconnect. It's what creates what I call the woe is me mentality. What is the woe is me mentality? The woe is me mentality is when you, for example, take this approach. You know, maybe you haven't been in church for a month, two months, three months, and for whatever reason, you didn't get a phone call. Now you start blaming it on the church. Maybe you were in the hospital, okay, and uh, nobody called. Nobody, nobody inquired. Now, granted, how many of you know if we're not informed? That's another story. Can I hear an amen out there? See? But let's say, you know, no, no, no connection from the church, and all of a sudden you start blaming the church. The woe is me mentality. Now, let me just reassure you of something. If we are informed of something, believe me, our pastors will respond. Whether it's Pastor Dan, whether it's Pastor Al, whether it's Pastor Rich or myself, we will respond when we are informed. As a matter of fact, I tend to think that probably the greatest prayer warrior there is on the planet is Pastor Dan. Pastor Dan will pray you to heaven. He'll pray you healed, believe me. Believe me, when, you're, when he's done with you, you're going to feel a whole new person. So when I have issues, I just pass the get in my office, man. I need some help here. Man, when that guy starts praying for you, believe me, man, it's like the room just glows. Okay? But here's the point. Are you ready? Those guys do that because they love it. They, 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 they love to do it. They have no issue or problem responding. But here's something that we tend to overlook. Are you ready? They respond also because that's their job. That's your job. See, we got to get out of, are you ready, the doctor's visit mentality. Because sometimes that's how we treat the church. When you have relationships, it's a whole nother story. When I am ill at home, my home group responds immediately. Why? Because they know I'm missing. Are you hear what I'm saying? They're the ones that minister life into me. You know, when I have a need, I, I tell you what, the, the brother that you heard, James, that man has been such a blessing to me. Uh, I mean, literally, I, I can say that he, he has blessed me in so many ways. He sees things. He, you know, Pastor Vega, did you notice that you, have, you need to fix this or whatever? I said, well, I didn't really notice. I'll take care of it. 
But you see what I'm saying? You know, so every time there's a need, every time, you know, they immediately just respond. Whether it's spiritual, whatever the case might be. If, you know, if, if I notice one of my folks weren't, weren't there and, uh, on the Tuesday night that we have home group, they immediately will get a text from me the next day. Hey, just wanted you to know we missed you. You know, you okay? You need anything? You know? See, that's the commonality that takes place. Why? Because we formed, are you ready? Watch this, a body. See? We formed a little body there. So when there's a missing part, we notice it right away. It's instinctive, you know. There was a family in our home group, true story, house burnt down. This was about four years ago. House burnt down. The home group responded. Responded. Church wasn't even notified about it. Why? Because the home group responded. You see what I'm saying? Are you guys getting this? You see what I'm saying? Why? It wasn't, it wasn't like we had to ask. They just, we got to help. we got to help. we got to help. Relationships. Commonality. This is what it means to be the body of Christ. This is what connection groups is all about. It's not about just putting another burden on you to join a group. No. It's to fulfill the mandate of Christ for us to truly be his body. Are we learning something this morning? Okay. See, when you have people following after you because you have a relationship, they won't need a call from you because your actions or absence is going to trigger an autopilot response. And it's amazing to me, watch this now, if I can be very bold with you. You know, we're talking about Christians that have been saved for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You know, they, they, for whatever reason, they'll miss church or in the hospital or whatever, and they start blaming the church. You know what I will tell somebody like that? Now, you have to understand. I, 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 you know, if, if you've been blood-bought, filled with the Holy Ghost, and you're whining and complaining, you need to grow up. Turn to the person next to you and say, you know the pastor's telling you some truth, even though you don't like it. Go, you can tell them. They don't mind. <laughs> you need to grow up, man. Five, 10, 15 years, 20 years as a born-again, spirit-filled believer, and all you're doing is bench warming? I have to ask what Bible you're reading during your devotions. I don't know if it's the same one that I got up here in my little nook, okay? Because the whole New Testament is about mandates. Mandates, mandates, mandates. Why? Because you're carrying with you the two greatest sources in the history of mankind, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And he just didn't put that there so that you can go around glowing. Amen? No. He put that there so you can put it to use. You are to be equipped for ministry. Now, this next verse that I'm going to read is probably by far the most violated verse in the Bible. And when I say violated, I'm not talking about unbelievers violating it. I'm talking about Christians violating it. Now, some of us might think that, well, you know, when you talk about violating Scripture, well, you know, I don't cheat, I don't uh, steal, you know, I don't commit adultery. We think that that's, not, that's the only thing that's limited to, you know, violating Scripture. But let me tell you something. The next Scripture that I'm going to read is probably the most violated Scripture because if the body, if the whole body of Christ were to respond to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, I guarantee you two-thirds of the United States would be saved. And watch this. And we'd have no issues with government or the elections for that matter. Okay? Because look what it says in Ephesians 4.11. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. Why did he give them? Here it comes. Are you ready? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. To equip his people for works of service. Question, who makes up his people? Notice only five of you responded because I'm about to catch you. Okay? Say, we are. We are his people. So our primary job as pastors is to equip you guys. Now, that is not to say, okay, that we're not going to do what you do because one of these big culture shifts that Pastor Santoro wants to see in his staff is this. We lead by example and no longer by words. Do what we do. Don't do what we simply say. It's a big change for us. 
So if we're, if we're asking you guys to be connected with a group, that means we have to be connected with the group. If we're asking you guys to come to midweek so you can be nurtured and inspired, you know, in this, these next several weeks, for example, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Think about it. The most powerful resource after the Bible that God has imparted in each and every one of you. Do you know how to use it? Do you know how to tap into it? That's what we're talking about on Wednesday nights. You should be here learning that. Are you hearing me? Okay. It says to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now watch this. you got to love this. Then it goes on to say, until we reach unity in the faith, that's commonality, and in the knowledge, that's word, okay, of the Son of God, and become mature, that's growth, that's right for service, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I want you to really look and receive the revelation of this scripture. Think about it. Oh, man. You don't mature because you're sitting in that chair right now getting fed. That's been a real deceitment from the enemy. You know, that's why I laugh every time I hear somebody, you know, you know, when we talk about people that come to faith church and they say, hey, so, so glad to have you at faith church. Uh, you know, uh, why did you come to faith church? Well, I just want to get fed. And that's it. It's like, I just, well, I'm coming because I just want to get fed. I just want to get fed. Fed for what? Exactly. Okay. Because we don't, watch this. We don't feed here. We transmit this book to you, which basically is a book of knowledge and commands. So you don't feed on a command. You follow. Can I hear an amen out there? Can you imagine if all your kids did was feed on your commands? I want you to think about that for a second. Uh, honey, go clean up your room. I'm just getting fed, Mom. Thank you. I'll, I'll think about it. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Lord, you know. You know, hon, I told you not to do that. I know, honey, I know, mom, but I'm just gonna, keep feeding me, mommy. I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be fine. Just keep feeding me. You see how that doesn't make sense? Can you see how that, that, that makes absolutely no sense? That's why James 4, 17, what did I say? Sin is knowing what to do and not doing it. Now, I, I'm not, by the way, I'm not angry. I'm just excited, Okay. <laughs> And I, and I just like to preach it the, the way it's, it, it, it's, it's written. Okay, don't need a theological interpretation to understand what's going on here. What this needs is not theological interpretation. It needs obedience. That's what it needs. But here's what everybody misses. Watch this. The way we become mature is not just you getting the leading, the guidance, and the instruction from the pulpit. It's when you guys begin to interact with each other. That's where maturity takes place. That's why I would never give up my home group for nothing. Because when I'm hearing the others feeding into me and seeing how maybe, could we discuss our, our sermons, for example. And I love to hear how the sermons are, are, are ministering to the people. You see, so I'm being just as edified. I'm being encouraged. I'm being inspired. It's reminding me of the cause. Is anybody learning something this morning? See? So if we're going to grow in Christ, then you must make the time to say, okay, you know what? I got to do it. I, I, I need to do this. And here's another very important reason why. Are you ready? If we're, gonna, if we're to take inventory, for example, how many of us really spend time with God every day, whether it's five minutes or an hour, or maybe it's not. One of the things that connection groups will do, and write this to your notes, it'll give you spiritual accountability. Okay. I mean, I'm not telling you this to make you feel guilty, but only to point out that just how important it is to surround yourself with a group of people that will be an encouragement for you and help you with spiritual accountability. Now, let me explain what spiritual accountability is because we, we kind of got that wrong too. When I say spiritual accountability, I'm not referring to the fact that, uh, you know, you commit a sin or a fallout and now we're going to hold you accountable. I think that's the Holy Spirit's role. And how many, how many know the Holy Spirit will do that for you? Okay. And then if you need assistance on that, then you ask for it. Spiritual accountability is when you can come together with the group and they will encourage your walk with Christ. Because can I ask you an honest question? How many of us sometimes just don't feel like praying? Can I hear any men out there? You just get hit one of those days where oh, I'm just not feeling it today, you know. Just don't feel like praying today. You know, you open up the Bible and you're like, ah, oh, don't feel like doing this today. Go to work. Things are stressful. Got marriage problems, financial problems, challenges all over the place, okay? And you feel like you're by yourself. That's when you need a group to encourage you, 
to pray for you, to lift you up, to let you know that the Holy Spirit is still living inside of you regardless of how you feel. Amen. 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 That is spiritual accountability. I'm a pastor, and I need spiritual accountability. Believe me. There are times when I, I'm struggling. You know, get together with my home group, man, I feel all right. You see? Now, I feel good here coming to church, seeing all you guys and everything. But my point is that there's something about relationships that takes it to a whole other level. Ephesians 2.19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. Fellow citizens with God's people. Okay? And also members of the household. Say household. Now, please write this word down. Your connection or home group is your covering. It's your covering. Now, let's talk about this covering thing for a moment because this thing has really been, been abused. I mean, I've seen abuses in this area that just uh, uh, silly, okay? And I'm going to give you some real-life stories. Here's some real testimonies, okay? We had a, a family, a couple that came to the Spanish ministry, okay? Really loving it, you know, really enjoying it. And so they really felt like, you know, they needed to move on and may perhaps be a part of the Spanish ministry. And what's really sad is that they wanted to leave with the pastor's blessing, okay? And so when they communicated the pastor's their concerns, you know, and they felt that it was probably a better fit for them over there, here's what this pastor told them. This pastor told them, well, you know that if you go over there, you're going to die. That's, would you believe that's what, that's what he told them? He says, you know, you could potentially be killed because you don't have covering now. I, first of all, I laugh within me. But the second question that I ask this couple is, let me ask you something. Do you believe that? Because if you believe that, then you obviously don't read the Bible. Okay, you obviously don't read the Bible. Because the Bible says we're not to be moved by a spirit of fear. Fear is not of God. Okay, okay, covering. Let me give you another story. Okay, we had a lady that came to our home group. Okay, before she came to our home group, she called me. She got my number, she called me. She says, Pastor, listen, I, I really need you to do this. I was like, well, what, what? And she said, well, you know, I'm new. You don't know me, but this brother encouraged me to come to the home group. But I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me. I was like, well, why, what happened? She says, because... I left my old church, and now I'm uncovered. I have no covering. Okay? I have no covering. And I'm like, what makes you think that? I said, well, you know, my old pastor told me that if I left church for whatever reason, that now I'm going to be out there exposed. I have no covering, and the devil is just going to have a field there with me. So I have to be sure that I'm covered. So I'm calling you ahead of time. So you, even though you haven't met me or haven't gone to your group yet, but I'm coming. But I need you to start praying for me so I can have covering. <laughs> True story. I'm not, you can ask my wife. I'm not going to so here's what I told her, and I'm going to tell you today, in case you're one of those covering fanatic freaks, okay? <laughs> all right? Because here's the deal. Are you ready? First of all, okay, if you are born again, if you're born again, just raise your hand for a moment. Okay, I want to make sure I'm addressing the right audience here. If you are born again, okay, the greatest covering you will have is not something provided by a church or a man for that matter, but by the blood of Jesus Christ and the fact that you are a walking temple of the Holy Spirit and you have the Word of God that is your sword. I cannot provide that for you. Only He can. So if you believe that, I got news for you. You've been covered from the moment you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. And if you need some Bible, let me throw it at you. Romans 5, 9 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're covered. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, do you not know? You know, you got to love when a verse starts that way because you know what this means, right? McFly, do you not know, okay? That your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You mean to tell me you're going to let the devil mess with you when he knows you belong to him? Because that's all I got to remind the devil. It's like, what you doing, man? I belong to him. I'm covered. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're covered. Okay. Let me throw one more at you. Ephesians 6.17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So anytime it comes to me with this covering foolishness, I say, you're not reading your Bible, obviously. That is the power of the Word. That gets reinforced, by the way, in your home group. That's why I say your home group is your covering. Why? Because they're going to remind you of what you already have. And you no longer have to walk in fear. Amen? Are we learning something this morning? I got time for one more point here. Point number four. You ready? 
ministry is the priority of a believer. Why should we be interested? Well, here's the thing. Second of Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 says the following. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. Hello, there it is. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of what? Sound mind. When you're going around thinking like, you know what? Next time somebody talks to me about that, I'm just going to give you an umbrella. That's what I'm going to do. Here's an umbrella if you, if you fear that so much. Because if you have a sound mind, that means that mind is being influenced by God's word. You just have to believe it. Receive it and believe it. Believe that you belong to him. Okay? But here's the thing. The Bible says that you've been endued with power. Now, I don't got time to go through all the verses. So if you want to do your fill-ins, I'm just going to roll with this real quick. Got your pens ready? For example... The Bible, the Bible emphasizes us in Ephesians 2.10 that you've been created for ministry. 2 Timothy 1.9 says you've been saved for ministry. Okay? Galatians 1.15 says that you've been called into ministry. 1 Peter 4.10 says that you've been gifted for ministry. Matthew 28, 18 and 19 says that you've been authorized for ministry. Okay? Matthew 20, 28 says you've been commanded to ministry. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says that the body of Christ needs my ministry. Okay? Romans 4, 12 says I am accountable for my ministry. And lastly, Colossians 3, 23 talks about that you've been rewarded for ministry. Notice all the things that happen simply because you take part in a home or small group. Let me read you this testimony that I'm going to close with. I just got this yesterday, just yesterday, from the, not from the uh, 6 o'clock service, okay? Let me read it to you. But this really blessed me. As a matter of fact, I called the guy's fiance who happens to attend our home group because uh, it was the first time that he attended, uh, you know, our fellowship. And, uh, and he writes me a letter. Okay, it says, Dear Pastor Vega, I just wanted to take this moment to say thank you for inviting me over to your house for your, your birthday party. We were actually celebrating my birthday party, but I didn't tell anybody about it. Okay, um, your birthday bar party barbecue. I truly did feel honored. For many years, I was not a part of the church, but thankfully, that's beginning to change. I especially am grateful for all the wisdom that's imparted to me from your sermons. I hope one day to be able to talk with you. I just joined the Tuesday night men's meeting. So that's next week. So I will see you then. Thank you. I'm not going to mention his name, but handwritten, by the way. Okay, just got this. Now, here's the point. Are you ready? If you do your part, we can get thousands of these. Think about the first story I gave you. Think about this one. And again, didn't preach anything about Jesus. Just lived out what he tells us to do. That's why as we close today, I'm not going to do an altar call today. As we close today, I want to encourage you for one thing, to do one thing today. And right now, I want to dismiss all the connection group leaders. So if you lead a connection group of any kind, home group, here, you're dismissed right now because I want you to prepare. So go ahead. You can go. If it's women's, men's, doesn't matter. Home group, Bible study, asset, whatever, go out there and get ready, okay? Because if what happened yesterday and this morning happens again, believe me, we are going to be busy out there. We're going to be busy, okay? We're going to be very busy because I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God is about to do something amazing here at Faith Church like never before, okay? I want you. Now, we're not signing anybody up today, by the way. This is a very carefully crafted strategy that me, Pastor Santoro, and a few of the pastors kind of been working on. I and mean, this has been about a four or five, maybe even longer, six month thing in, in the working. Okay. We just want you to go out there, have some coffee and cookies on us, and converse. Talk to the group leaders. Find out more information. There's groups that have to be with women, married, single, men, adults, students. And let me just uh, talk about something that God just revealed to me about students. Um, there will be next weekend a banner for Spanish, okay? So let me just take a quick note to the Latino community. Si usted está asistiendo este servicio y está buscando un grupo que se está reuniendo donde tocamos el tema de la Biblia en español, definitivamente va a haber un grupo allá afuera para recibirte. The reason why I say that is because you'd be surprised how many Spanish families we have here at Faith Church that attend the English service. And we don't care. You know why? Because we're one family. Spanish, Portuguese, don't matter. You know? We're... This is the same body. 
But what we noticed, though, is that it's always been beneficial because we do have folks that attend. This is kind of funny. We have folks that attend the English service that attend the Spanish home group. Okay? And that, that's awesome. That, that, that's, that shows unity. Okay? Because it's all about one vision, one family. But if you're here, as you're okay, and you want, you, maybe you can relate better with a, with, with a Spanish group, guess what? You can still be a part of our home group and still continue to attend this service. Okay? So make sure you go there. But now, here's a new revelation that I've been really excited about because of the response I've gotten. I mentioned in the 6 and the 9 o'clock, and I'm mentioning now, that under students, okay, we realize now that we desperately need a college slash young adults group. We don't have one. But guess what? We're going to have one even if I have to lead it myself. Okay? So here's what I'm going to encourage. All you guys, college bound or in college, young adults. Now, I got to put a, a realistic age group on this. I'm talking about maybe from 19, say, to maybe 30. Okay? Uh, if we have to go beyond that, we'll, that'll be a separate group. But if you're here, 19 to, to 29, 30, feel like you're disconnected, you feel like there's nothing here for you just yet, okay, or if you're college bound or in college, I've already got a slew of signups already just mentioning it. That means that there's a need here for it, okay. So I want you to go out there and make sure you either see me or if you don't get to me, okay, because I want to take your name, address, email, okay, if you don't get to me, at least make sure you mention it to one of the leaders, give them their information, and just say you want to be a part of the college group. I realize now that that is a tremendous need, okay? I remember when I graduated from college, okay? Now, you have to understand, I grew up in a very legalistic church. So when I graduated from college, unfortunately, there was nothing for us. There literally was nothing for us. That's why a lot of us went to other churches. But that's going to change here at Faith Church. That is going to change. Faith Church is going through a cultural change, and I really believe we're about to experience one of the greatest revivals in the history of this church, not because we're going to get a new move of the Spirit, Okay? But because I believe as you guys respond, God is going to begin to use you guys like never before. Amen. Did we learn something this morning?